After September 11th, I became the chief of counterterrorism operations in Pakistan. I was told on my first day to come up with the standard operating procedure for taking down a terrorist safe house. So I, I literally sat at a desk with a legal pad thinking, well, how, how am I going to do this? What would, what would be the first thing I, I would want to do if I was going to take down a safe house? Well, I would want it to be dark. So let's say 2 o'clock in the morning we'll do it. So I wrote 0200 at the top of the page. And then little by little I came up with this plan. Finally we got a report from headquarters that Abu Zubaydah was somewhere in Pakistan. Now, at the time, we thought that Abu Zubaydah was the third-ranking person in al-Qaeda. And all we knew was that he was somewhere in Pakistan. But Pakistan is the size of Texas. He made one mistake that allowed us to narrow his location down to 14 different sites. So we brought in a large team from headquarters, half CIA, half FBI. We brought in weapons and electronics and walkie-talkies. and We hit all 14 sites at exactly the same time. And he happened to be in one of the houses. He tried to escape by jumping from the roof of his house to the roof of the neighboring house. And the Pakistanis shot him three times in the stomach, the groin, and the thigh. And he was very gravely wounded. He was out of it for a day and a half before he finally came out of a coma. But I was the first person to speak to him. At first, he asked for a glass of red wine. And then a couple hours later, he asked me to smother him with a pillow. Once he sort of had his bearings and he realized, oh my God, the Americans have me, he wanted to know what was going to happen to him, where he was going to be sent. He was, he was very frightened. Um, I think of, of the unknown. I, I didn't know where he was going to go, and I didn't know that he was going to be tortured. I didn't have a need to know. He would recite poetry to me that he had written. He cried at the thought of, he said, never knowing the joy of fatherhood, never knowing the touch of a woman. I remember telling him, I should hate you, and I should want to kill you, and I don't. I said, you're pathetic. I mean, he was just a young guy. He wasn't even 30 years old, and all he did was cry. And I remember saying to a colleague of mine, this is the fearsome Al-Qaeda? This is what we've been so worried about and so frightened of? It was a revelation to me. They're just guys. They're just, and not even that, they're just young, illiterate guys that had nothing else to do. And believe me when I say 99% of them had never read the Quran. They weren't true believers. They, they hadn't pledged fealty to Osama bin Laden. They just wanted to get out of that village in Yemen and maybe make a couple of bucks. It made me think the mission wasn't all it was cracked up to be. And then a colleague came in and said, headquarters is sending in a private jet to pick him up and take him to his next location. At about three o'clock in the morning, we wheeled him out. He was so upset, he asked me to hold his hand. He asked if we were going to kill him. And I said, no, no, we've been looking for you for a long time. In fact, I said, you're gonna get the best medical care that the US government has to offer. And so the doctor gave him a shot of Demerol and it knocked him out and we loaded him onto this private jet. One of the guys who had flown out to escort him to his onward location got off the plane. The guy was dressed completely in black, black mask, black hat, black sweater. And he said, my name, he said, John. And I said, who are you? And he lifted up his mask and he was a former supervisor of mine at headquarters. And he said, what are you doing here? And I said, oh, I'm chief of counterterrorism. I said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm gonna take your prisoner onward. He said, who is he anyway? And I said, I'm sorry, man, you don't have a need to know. And I said, where are you taking him? And the guy said, I'm sorry, man, you don't have a need to know. And I said, well, safe flight. And the plane took off and I never saw him again. When I returned to headquarters from Pakistan, I was told that the CIA had begun a program that they were calling enhanced interrogation techniques. 
And did I want to be trained in the use of these enhanced interrogation techniques? Uh, I had a visceral problem with it. First of all, let's call it what it is. It's torture. They can, they can call it whatever euphemism they want, but it's torture. So I went back to the counterterror center and I said, I have a problem with this and I don't want to be involved. And then I heard rumors that we had created this system of secret prisons around the world, that even the heads of state in these countries didn't know that we had these secret prisons there, that these were deals struck between the head of the CIA and the head of whatever that country's service was. These weren't meant to be permanent facilities. They were just meant to extract information where we didn't have to worry about laws or human rights. But, you know, those of us who weren't read into these programs only got this in bits and pieces. I had no idea how extensive the secret prison system was until a couple of years after I left the agency and I read about it in the press. Because we're Americans and we're better than that. But at the time, you didn't feel that way. At the time, I was so angry and I wanted so much to help disrupt future attacks on the United States that I felt it was the only thing we could do. And with Zabeda, you think that was successful? It was. I had been misinformed by the CIA. The CIA told those of us in headquarters that they had waterboarded Abu Zubeda one time, that he had cracked, and that he had provided actionable intelligence. He answered every question, just like I'm sitting here speaking to you. So in your view, the waterboarding broke him? I think it did, yes. And did it make a difference in terms of? It did. The threat information that he provided disrupted a number of attacks, maybe dozens of attacks. That turned out to be untrue. And we know it was untrue because in 2009, the CIA Inspector General's report was released indicating that Abu Zubaydah had been waterboarded 83 times and still did not provide actionable intelligence. Believe me, for the life of me, I wish I could take that back. But I talked about the issue with the information that I had at the time, and the information was just simply incorrect. Abu Zubaydah may never have been an Al-Qaeda member. Now, in retrospect, we're finding out. He may have been somebody who supported Al-Qaeda's goals. He may have been someone who was a professional logistician where he was helping them procure medicine or false documents. We don't really know. But he was not the senior Al-Qaeda official that the CIA and NSA and the White House wanted us to believe.